July 1945, as we climb onto the trucks, a surprise awaits those who sailed on board the Thomas Marshall from Cherbourg to New York and had to surrender their sold books. The sold books have arrived in Colorado and will be distributed to their owners by the camp spokesman at the company office. I thumb through the book whose absence in Oklahoma caused me to be separated from Hocker and Schulz, left Siegfried with me, and finally brought together with Kunze, whom I regard quickly for days as my friend. Nearly every day he demonstrates his affection for me in his own reserved way, and I too am very sympathetic toward him. Last night he confided to me that he is a former member of the SS. I promised to help him remove his blood-type tattoo from under his arm with a needle and condensed milk if possible, or if necessary, a razor blade. This binds us even more closely in these days of dark secrets. Naturally Siegfried is initiated into our closed group, but only after I am able to allay Kunz's doubts during the course of the day. It would have been simply a breach of trust toward Siegfried, since he, like me, cares for Kunze, I need his help. And finally, there is no fear that he would betray Kunze. When I return to the barracks, I carry my Soldbuch in my hand. Still lost in thought, I make no move to take my swimsuit from the window sill as usual. This seems to bother Kunze and Siegfried. Are you thinking to make use of your passbook? Siegfried rasps after a minute of silence. Do you want to get rid of me when you ask something like that? I respond with a twinkle in my eye. You have the possibility to spend the rest of your time as a prisoner without doing any work? No one would blame you. In fact, just the opposite. Why should we hack sugar beets for the Yankees? They give neither us nor our families in the homeland enough to eat, Kunzi suggests with a shrug of the shoulders. I will tell you something, men. The work in the fields is good medicine for us. If they had not pulled that trick on us with the sold books, we would all be in Oklahoma picking cotton. But fate chose another course for us, and we already know why. I am very sorry that I lost Hocker and Schultz. But did I really lose them? Certainly not. The time we were together has only ended. Our hearts and souls are always together, just like with our family to whom we are even more bonded, the greater the distance we are from them. Siegfried, we have not forgotten Brilla, even if we don't speak of him every day. But why should I make a big speech? They have just whistled for our pay, and I need a few things very badly from the canteen. That's why I am going to thin sugar beets on Monday, not because of your beautiful eyes that now stare so dumb. I laugh from the bottom of my heart and shove my easily confused friends out of the barracks. At 4.45 p.m. I am a rich prisoner of war. I now possess twenty-one and half dollars for thirty-six workdays. Naturally they are not real dollars, of which half of mankind dreams, but coupons for which I can only purchase things in the camp. But no beer and no cigarettes. Since the end of the war, tobacco ration cards have been introduced, just like in old Europe. Still there is a brisk business in the canteen, since there is still plenty to buy. And what brave soldier does not think of his suffering loved ones when he looks at it all? It is a paradox that in our present camp, when our return home seems so remote, every comb, sewing needle, fine toilet soap, skin cream and such things are purchased in great quantities. But in the first place, what else can we do with the hard-earned money? And in the second place, there glows a flame of hope in the furthermost corners of our hearts that one day we will see our homeland again. That is why on payday everyone goes shopping, and those items mint for the dear family members are buried in the bottom of the sea sack like a treasure. Even we three friends are no exception. After dinner thick clouds of cigarette smoke hang in the barracks, so that it is nearly impossible to remain inside. A glance in the recreation room is enough to quickly close the door. The table tennis is occupied and surrounded by those waiting. Because of our unnecessary chatter, we have missed the opportunity to find a suitable location. Only the latrine, in which is located the shower and washrooms, lies lonesome in the dim glimmer of the camp lights. The moment is right. The operation can begin, while I sterilise a needle over the flame of the alcohol containing aftershave lotion, and Siegfried stands ready with the salve. Kunze works on bringing the condensed milk we took from breakfast to a simmer. His heater is next to mine in the shower room, 
and consists of a can into which is poured a bottle of aftershave lotion and in which a smaller can holding the milk is placed. The can is wrapped with wire and stretched out long to serve as a handle. Finally, we are ready. Kunze stretches out on the damp floor of the shower room, his head resting on his underarm. I work the stone into the shape of a zero and cover the arm with a linen cloth soaked in the milk. I stick the needle through the cloth into the skin, following the dark circle so that the milk can dissolve the mark of cane. After some time, the whole process is over. Now we wait to see if it is successful. It is important for Kunze that no one notice the plaster under his arm, which, in these depressed days, if discovered by a half-crazy, could lead to serious trouble. After our work, we try to ease our nerves by walking around the camp. What shall we do in Greeley? Siegfried asks theatrically. You like to watch the voting girls, Kunze, who has once again found his good disposition after the recent torture. Nods. Perhaps you don't, Siegfried demands. Yes, indeed, I reply, even more than I should. So, he snorts, almost insulted, I feel sorry for you. It's about time to finally know for what reason a man is a man. You always speak about men, Siegfried. Don't our girls have to go without, Kunze censures him. What do you mean ours? I don't have any firm relationship, thank God. We told you something about Brilla and Schultz before, but we're completely still about Hocker. Women bring only sorrow. You are hardly gone, and then the devil is loose. With some, the bed is not even cold before another is already lying in it. Siegfried maintains. You are crazy. It is obvious you have only associated with whores. Kunze sets the record straight. Knock it off. What does that have to do with it? Let's be honest. When we are away, we are not happy alone in bed, is Siegfried's opinion. And I do not make any effort to contradict him. You have not known true love, otherwise you would not talk such nonsense. Kunze shows his understanding of Siegfried's position. I don't want to cause you any pain, but perhaps you will remember my words. I can imagine that a young lady who has not heard for a long time from her fiancé takes the opportunity when it is offered, and you can be sure that they do come about. Siegfried wipes away every illusion. What do you think, Helmut? Kunze turns to me and forces me to express my opinion. Basically, Siegfried is right, only we are making the matter too light. We don't want to believe it about our own wives, but still we believe that it is possible with all the others. They are no better or worse than us. It takes both a woman and a man to make a whore. If I can use Brilla as an example, we know that it was a woman who ruined him. He took revenge on her type every time he had the chance. Why shouldn't a woman take revenge when she is disillusioned, and they will be disillusioned even more than men because they are more dependent? You know how first we desire them, but how in most cases, afterward we forget them, I say, in most cases. And now you, Kunze, only when we are really in love, when two souls become one, is when we never forget it, then it is love. Everything else is idle magic, which immediately flees as soon as we have our pants on again. I end my explanation, even though I am abroad and across the sea, if I still did not feel certain that my Brigitte loves me just as much now as before, who knows what I would have done the evening of May 9th, 1945, after the most bitter hour of my life had struck, that I can still who beats, I owe alone to this knowledge, she gave me the strength to want to live. If someone tries to convince me that love is purely physical, then I feel sorry for the poor wretch, because he follows his instincts like an animal without enjoying the highest pleasure which comes when the souls and bodies of two people who share real love melt together. After Kunze ends, we all three look up to the canvas of stars in the heavens, just in time to see the light from a falling star, and experience the impression that the Almighty has underscored Kunze's words with a flaming stroke. As we silently return to the barracks, I muse that Kunze is right, and everything else is filth or senseless, misconstrued theories. 77 July 1945. I require from you that the assigned sections will be hoed. The farmer Boussac blares threateningly around 3 p.m. 
after we have lost all desire to work and now sit on our haunches. Do it yourself, the pastor suggests, which causes the farmer to charge off in a fit to try and stir up the guard. He simply shrugs his shoulders while a cigarette dangles from between his lips. After the farmer realises he cannot pressure us to keep going, he offers to take us home as soon as we are finished. Shall we show him what we can do? Kunza asks the sweat-covered faces. He only gave us water which has been warm for a long time. He can hoe them himself. He had plenty to eat for lunch, is the majority response. If we don't make the quota, we will still be sitting here at nine o'clock tonight. Someone calls us back to reason. That does not matter. What do you want to do in that pen? Here you can look as far as the eye can see, and there is no barbed wire to destroy the view, our weather beagle says, who owes his name to the fact that he spent most of the war at a weather station. What the hell? Let's get it done. Otherwise, they will bring in spotlights like they have done with the other groups. Another suggests. Let's go. The pastor joins in, and everyone picks up his hoe. At 4pm we climb onto the transport while the grinning farmer closes the tailgate. Immediately we are underway, rolling away from the sugar beet fields that shimmer as though struck by a thousand bolts of lightning. We served the skinflint, Siegfried laughs maliciously. We handled him today like we did the drunken Polinsky last Tuesday. The pastor rubs his hands together as the wagon leaves the road and follows a path through the field. What does that mean? The rest of us wonder. After a short trip, the guard says, Start work again, pointing to a badly overgrown sugar beet field. Sit still, bellows the staff sergeant. We are not dumb boys who are promised something and not given it. Come on. The guard waves, pointing to his watch. You have to work until five o'clock. Kiss our asses, the pastor screams. Shut up and start work right now, replies the bored guard as he plays with his rifle. There's no reason to resist. Others put us into the mess and now we have to deal with it, I warn them, so as not to allow the matter to come to a head. I suggest we get out and thresh the field short and small, Siegfried offers. Good, is the rumbling threat rising out of the pastor's breast, but where I touch, no beets will grow again. Shortly after five o'clock, the hoes are thrown onto the wagon as the farmer watches with a hamster-like grin. You worked hard, you stupid krauts, he mocks us as we follow the hoes. Still we laugh, satisfied because tomorrow when the sun is shining, his first glance at his sugar beet fields will be an eye-opener. Dinner consists only of sour milk and three boiled potatoes. The dissatisfaction mounts quickly. Either something to eat or no more work is the sentiment of the non-commissioned officers, and it infests nearly the entire camp. Only the Austrians give it the cold shoulder. The Americans told us if we work hard, they will soon send us home. Is their argument against a strike? If we don't work, then they will send us home even sooner. They won't get rid of good workers is the opposite point of view offered by the non-commissioned officers. Neither good nor bad work, neither strike nor submission. Instead, following the golden middle road will lead us to better food and to home, the cautious maintain. The camp leader suggests to our barracks, if you listen to me, you will go to work this week. I do not believe the commander is to blame for the sparse rations, even though it is maintained that he can direct the camp however he wants. The barracks are his private possession, and he is the kingpin of the sugar beet factories. There is no proof for all of these rumours. We know that there are farmers who hate the factory bosses because they are dependent on them. But that is none of our business. They carry water on both sides and are free-born citizens, while because we lost the war, we are booty for our former enemies. A united action against the hunger rations is not possible in this camp, and if we pursue it, we will be the stupid ones. The camp leadership is of the opinion that the prisoners whose service grades are unconfirmed are sympathetic to a meeting. We can be sure that they have already thought about what they are going to do with us. Personally, it is my opinion that now we are experiencing the consequences of the German concentration camps, and therefore we should respond with less productive work which we can attribute to poor nutrition. That is the way we can achieve what we want. More to eat, 
I am still as convinced as ever that we have to show the Americans that we would rather be destroyed than be enslaved. Our rabble-rouser begins another speech. It is clear that the camp commander has to submit reports to his superiors. When he writes that the German prisoners are quiet and productive despite the shortage of food, then the Americans will think they can experiment with us any way they want. We have already seen the third film about fishing, timbering and fur trapping in Alaska. The thought will not leave me that one of these days we will be, like the Afro-Americans, second-class American citizens. In the grand scheme of politics, it looks like the Americans and the Russians will come out very well. If it stays that way, then the victors will depopulate Germany and scatter us to the four winds. History will then record that they and those who came later sanctioned how we were handled. Man has a right to his homeland. That is why we must never tire of taking every opportunity to further that right. In the reading room lies a newspaper which contains a small notice. Send the threat home, they don't work, only eat our food, and stand united with the German officers and non-commissioned officers regarding what should happen in the States. You see out there, our conception is right when we maintain that they will never release a good worker. In about three weeks the beats will be hoed, then we have missed the opportunity. If we simply disappear in the wilds of the Rocky Mountains or Alaska, then there is no sense for rebellion. No rooster will crow if they allow us to starve. That is why I am in favour of an immediate strike. Tomorrow evening it will be reported in the local newspaper and the next day in all newspapers. People will talk about us, reporters will come, the churches will join us, and you will see that they must serve us chicken for breakfast. Comrades, we are in a free land, throw off the yoke of subservience. We sense the sympathy of this free people. We are industrious, clean and reliable, which the farmers confirm every day and which our guards can underscore. Impressed by the speech of the paratrooper staff sergeant, the non-commissioned company is all the more disposed to refuse to work. But while we are busy drafting a resolution to the commander, a rumour makes the rounds that transfers will be made from the camp in the next few days. The camp spokesman confirms that he has seen a transfer list and that a sergeant confided in him that the disruptive element of the camp would disappear. There is no doubt who will be sent into the desert, 17th of July, 1945, after we deliver the work clothes and bedding to the clothing building, Siegfried, Kunze and I return to the barracks and tie our already packed sea sacks. Travel fever simmers around us, in the rafters of the barracks hangs the dense and sweet smell of countless cigarettes. I wonder where we will land this time, Siegfried says, and twists himself a cigarette. If we go north, that will be bad, Kunza mumbles while his moist, deep blue eaves look over my bed and out the window, which seems to flitter because of the heat. Maybe we will meet Schultz and Hocker in Alaska. I play with the possibility as it sends a shudder up and down my spine. Damn it anyway, don't drive yourself crazy, and if so, Breed will be baked in Alaska. Perhaps in the meantime Hocker got the recipe for Beerbakon, then nothing can go wrong. Seafried snarls and grabs his sea sack since the Whistlifer assembly has just blown. Get out of here, screams the pastor. I have to clean out the room. That today of all days I have barracks duty. We hear him cuss in the room for the last time as we follow Siegfried outside. Thirty minutes later, 350 non-commissioned officers climb onto the transports. Take care and greetings for the homeland. If you should see it again, the inmates of Camp Greeley call to us as the wheels begin to turn. At 4pm, we exchange the hard seats of the truck for the soft upholstery of the Pullman coaches. At 4.20pm, the train rolls out of quiet Greeley. With ever-increasing speed, we travel through the land that has drunk our sweat, while our eyes scan the green sea of sugar beets. We do not have a permanent location anywhere. The words of Schultz come to me, which he cited during the many changes of camps in Cherbourg. We are headed north. Kunze rips me from my silent contemplation. He is afraid it is Alaska, I think, and choose not to look into his sad eyes since the sound of his voice has already upset me. That doesn't mean anything. We have been travelling only for an hour. 
I laugh out of the window as I stare at the eerie forms of the rocky mountains along whose foot we travel. A wonderful mountain range, Siegfried praises in his carefree manner, which does make my heart lighter. It is because of Brigitte, Kunze registers after a pause, as he takes a photo out of his wallet and stares at it like he has lost the world, you will see her again. I force a smile and open my tobacco pouch. It is funny, I think. This Brigitte is not actually pretty in so far as one can judge from her photo, and yet he hangs on her like a blind man. Cheyenne, Wyoming. He points with his index finger on the window as we look out at the gentle view of a city after the train makes a sharp right turn. Now our course is eastward, Siegfried offers, as the golden beams of the evening sun lie in his rust-red hair, lighting it like hammered copper. So nothing will come of a meeting with our old friends. If we were going to Alaska, we must go west over the mountains to the Pacific Ocean, I say to Kunz's relief, if they would only take this damn uncertainty away. He cracks his fingers. They probably don't know themselves what they are going to do with us, Siegfried titters. They know for certain. They will work us until we break. Another mixes in unnecessarily from the seat across from us. Dead workers have no value, I laugh at him. If it has to do with Germans, then yes. He nods rapidly. Don't talk nonsense, Kunze snaps at him, and he turns away, insulted. A black picture is always painted. It twists a person when there seems to be no end. Kunze sulks. They say such nonsense only for people to convince them otherwise. Or do you think they believe it themselves? I shake the returning feeling of discomfort from me. Then they should keep their mouths shut. Kunze gives a hostile glance at the blabber mouth, who responds by giving him the finger. They are three conceited apes, he snaps to his neighbour. They will have their asses ripped off when the trees fall. He looks with dumb cow eyes at us as the light in the coach is turned on. Do you mean that nothing can happen to your woodchopper's face? Siegfried jokes with him. The buzzards will eat you because you will destroy yourself through your presumptuousness. He spoils it for all of us. But only because of the smell of your ass. I throw at him. You perfumed bastard. He responds loudly enough to bring silence throughout the entire coach. I know that you are saving your money instead of buying soap so that you can enlarge your manure pile at home. I hit back since it is known the man was thrown out of the barracks in Oklahoma because he never washed. You had your red feed bag in the Le Mans Nazi company. Now where do you stand? His bitterness overflows. You were in the party yourself, you vulture. The pastor comes unexpectedly to my help. I was forced to. He defends himself and everyone laughs. Thank you, pastor. I wink at the Bavarian. Keep an eye on him. That sort talks too much in order to cover their own filth. He says so loud and clear that the others crawl inside themselves. In the meantime, night has fallen. Stars blink in the blue heaven over the silent plain. Only here and there in the distance the lights of a lonely farm shimmer. The heads of the tired men fall on their breasts. Sleep demands its rights and gives the confused soul rest. Twenty Fund, July 1945 On the morning of the fourth day of our trip, we detrain in Fort Dupont, Delaware. Thank God the monotonous train ride is behind us. Nothing, absolutely nothing of note occurred. Only a gigantic land from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean, from Camp Greeley to Fort Dupont, now we stand next to the track and look at the white-painted two-storey barracks of a U.S. training camp where young soldiers assemble in ranks. We are finished with that nonsense forever. I watch the men who respond automatically like robots to every command given in the sweltering heat that practically takes our breath away. If we had won the war, we could be in Russia commanding lice. Kunze turns his back on the recruits in training. How we have changed our outlook. Siegfried observes and wonders himself about the realisation. We went to a hard school, Siegfried. I laugh at him almost joyfully. If we were to be released, you could hang my diploma in the latrine for all I care, he responds dryly. We are once again on the Atlantic. All we need is a boat. In twelve days we could be in Germany. I build a dream castle. 
On the grounds in front of the two-story barracks of the prisoner of war camp Fort Dupont, we stand in five rows with shirts soaked with sweat, listening to the greeting of the obese camp spokesman. Consider yourselves embraced, you millions from Adolf's army, and enjoy yourselves with us. In the mess hall is an egg for each of you, potato salad, and all the peanut butter you want. Don't forget the salt tablets, because sweat is cheap here. Watch out for the mosquitoes beasties, they carry malaria. That is the reason for the screens on the windows. I will show you the barracks after you eat. This spokesman is a lusty noodle. We nod to each other as we enter the shady mess hall, receive the small portion from the mess sergeant, and find a free place to sit. Large cans of peanut butter are on every table. Boys, boys, this is a humid, hot climate. Kunza moans and strips off his khaki shirt. In the sweat of your brow, you will earn your daily bread, I quote from the Bible. Unfortunately, more sweat than bread. Siegfried laughs and helps me off with my dress shirt. I wonder what kind of work they do in this camp. You can't work here. It is just like a sauna. Kunze refuses to believe. Just wait. They will whisper it in our ear. Siegfried wipes the theme from the table and stuffs his mouth with peanut butter. After we have found a place in the second story of the barracks, we look up our friends in the washroom and find a recently vacated basin where we can shave. Then we shower and wash off the dust from our journey. A half hour later we lie in a deep sleep on the beds while the hot sun nearly brings steam from the ocean water. In the evening we assemble for roll call and the veil around our future activity is lifted. The newly arrived people have been sent here to fight mosquitoes. The German camp spokesman reveals to us in the presence of a US officer. We have permission for a rest day tomorrow so that the work will not begin until Monday. Saturday is inspection and the entire camp must be cleaned. After roll call is dinner and afterward I need your names, etc. Come to the office in groups so that we can take care of it without any friction. After dinner we lie behind the barracks in the grass and Siegfried says out of the blue, I don't like that fellow at all with his stupid talk about the Nazi company. There are perhaps a hundred men among us who were not in Alencon. The transfer here came not without a reason. We will soon find out if they have sent informants with us. I hope you are wrong. It is no secret that we were the agitators in Greeley. Do you think the Americans are asleep? I am not concerned that we were members of a Nazi company because other German officers and non-commissioned officers were assigned to them. No one can expect of us that we knew personally those to whom we gave our oath of loyalty. It is not a crime to be a German. I freely acknowledge that to a specific time period I believed in victory. Whoever denies that today is a coward who lowers himself even in the eyes of the victors. The victors would dirty their own hands if they seized those who have been misused and are not personally guilty of anything. We blamed the blabbermouth on the train because he could not find any other method of escape. That is why he wanted to shut us up with these memories. By the way, he was in the party. That is all too filthy for me. If the Americans also think that way, they will kick everyone in the behind that comes to him to implicate a comrade. I open my thoughts to Siegfried. The transfer cannot be a punishment. I like it better here than Camp Greeley. We will get used to the climate. Kunze also disagrees with Siegfried's point of view. You mean it is more beautiful here? In Colorado we had dry air? The Rocky Mountains were a daily joy to look upon and the work was healthy sport. Here it is damp and sultry, nothing to see, and the work is dangerous. I am afraid there will be a stink, Siegfried contradicts him. I am not happy with the work either. To fight malaria bearers can cause us to be infected with malaria. I agree with him. We will see what fate has prepared for us. Kunza rises and goes into the barracks as retreat is blown in the training camp. 25. July 1945. After a boring Sunday, most of which we spent sleeping behind the barracks, we climb on board the trucks without any concern. The spray cans and containers of poison have already been loaded, a fat sergeant confides to us. As the convoy starts to move, I glance at the fresh faces of those around me, while a quiet anxiety troubles me. What if we catch the dreaded malaria, 
I grumble without interruption until Siegfried shoves me, asking, What's wrong? Your face looks like you are going to a funeral, he says with laughter. I don't like it, I continue, and look at the poor huts of the Afro-Americans, which stand between the trees almost ready to collapse. They look hopeless. Kunze follows my eyes. In front of the huts, young boys romp while the heavy-set women hang washed shirts on the clothes line. But we have reached our objective. The trucks stop at the edge of a thick woods, which reaches to the edge of the village. Here is where the Atlantic Ocean begins. The pastor shoves his hands into his pants pockets, spits into the shallow, dirty water at our feet, and then stretches out his arm as though he is trying to pull the horizon toward land. Over there lies Germany. He screams like an actor on stage, and many pairs of eyes look out toward the line where sky and water seem to unite. At 9.30am, we fill the spray cans with the liquid poison from the containers. Like unknown beings, we speak from under the mosquito nets. Practically nothing can happen to us as long as we use the gloves and nets. There is nothing to see that is flying. We are to destroy their breeding grounds, which are on the edge of the countless ponds. We go to work. President Lincoln had a German in his cabinet. Schurz was the brave man's name. Siegfried grins as Kunze and I look at him in amazement after he has stretched out in the grass. So what? Kunze asks. What does that have to do with your laziness? It has a lot to do with the situation. He nestles his head in his crossed arms. He was opposed to slavery. That is why I am so sympathetic to the old countryman. I am also against it. You were not lazy in Colorado. Kunze still wonders and shakes his head in confusion while I lie down. Get up. There are snakes, black widow spiders, and whatever else I don't know, he bids us without comfort. Lie down, you earned your pay long ago, Siegfried encourages him. If the guards come, then we are the stupid ones. He hesitates. They are not that stupid that they put themselves in danger. I close my eyes, and finally Kunze decides to do the same. Around us is a quiet like we have not enjoyed for a long time. Finally alone, finally no glance of the guard or cry of the concerned comrades. Our only witness is the silent wood in which an unknown, secret-filled life goes on that is sympathetic to us. Quietly, the branches of the slender trees bend to frame the joy of three friends who are in difficult circumstances but are drawn from consciousness into dreams. As the sun rays slant through the roof of leaves from the west, a shrill whistle rips us from our heavenly rest. Quitting time, gentlemen, Kunze says and springs to his feet. Is it so late? I ask. It may be four o'clock, Siegfried suggests, fingering his tobacco pouch. Don't smoke now. We have to go to the vehicles, I insist. Good workers are the last to leave their workplace. He grins, but shoves the tobacco in his pocket and trots with us to the assembly place, where everyone arrives within ten minutes. We left the spray cans lying there. Kunze whispers in my ear as the guards count the group. We must get them, I say, shocked. Otherwise we will have trouble with the sergeant. Calm yourself. We dropped ours in the water long ago. The staff sergeant grins at me. Are you crazy? There will be trouble for sure, I declare. That's what we want. Do you believe they will do something to us? The staff sergeant asks. We slept like young gods. I reply with satisfaction and climb on the first truck. The camp is busy as the returning work details turn in their equipment. Where are the spray cans? The sergeant screams at us in English as we push by him. We don't understand. We laugh and pick up the tempo to get to the barracks while he is busy with others. At evening roll call the situation comes to a head. It is not possible for the Americans to say which group did not turn in their spray cans and so they want to know from us. But 350 German prisoners of war stand as silent as the grave. It could not be the intent of the guilty parties to bring punishment to all of you because of their foolish action. The German camp spokesman tries to change our fate after all of the efforts by the Americans have proven fruitless, including taking away our dinner. Be calm and keep your mouth shut, is whispered through the rows, until everyone realises that there is nothing to be learned from this crowd, 
and we are ordered to our barracks, where instead of dinner, chess or cards await us. At 7.30pm, the camp spokesman and the sergeant go through the barracks to try and shed some light on the matter. But everywhere, they run up against icy resistance. We returned everything we had, is the response on all sides. Be reasonable, he begs. The kitchen will serve the food immediately, as soon as the Americans know where the spray cans were left. He can take the snake feast to the mosquitoes, is the response to his good intentions. You are cutting your own flesh, because you won't get anything to eat until the matter is resolved, the sergeant goes over the spokesman to play his last trump. Tell him that we are used to hunger and while we are afraid of him, we are not willing to submit, a self-appointed spokesman responds. A man who, in Alençon, would slip out of the camp at night to steal milk from the French farmers and return to his comrades in the morning grey, satisfied and loaded with rich booty. That is nonsense. You can't hold out. They will punish you with hard labour. Men, be sensible, don't make the situation extreme. The Americans have enough of a sense of humour to close their eyes one time. He tirelessly continues to press the matter. In this climate, dinner is already spoiled. If we don't get any breakfast in the morning, no one needs to imagine that we will work, is the last answer to the begging and threats of the camp leadership, despite the desperate situation. We have manoeuvred ourselves into something for which we cannot take responsibility. I open the conversation after the camp spokesman and the sergeant have gone. That's right. Those who travelled with us from Alencon nod to me. But there is no return. We have suffered so much injustice that we simply no longer know who in the future will be right. They should send us home and stop this eternal rape of the little man. Do you really think we should not work in case they withhold breakfast? Is now the determining question in the sweltering room. I am of the opinion that everyone should be allowed to decide for himself what he thinks is right. Otherwise injustice would be found on our side, Kunza throws into the discussion. What do you consider right? asks the pastor anxiously. As the provisions, so the work. Kunza laughs into the serious faces. According to that, I understand no food, no work. Is that right? booms the bass voice of the staff sergeant. I have been understood, Kunzi offers, satisfied. What will the consequences be? Dr. Brown asks after a pause. At the most hunger, and that we have become acquainted with again since the 9th of May, the pastor expresses, uncaring. What do you think? Brown turns to me. This time I don't have an opinion, but I am willing to follow any decision like a good soldier. I dodge the responsibility. Then I will tell you something. Brown jumps to his feet. I have, to this point, never been mixed up with the business of forcing people to obey. It has usually turned out right how the group has responded to the pressure of the Americans. But we cannot forget that this is possible only because of their mentality, which is prone to respect the freedom of the individual in general. You know without a doubt that this does not have anything to do with the equipment. Instead you feel yourselves misused, and as human beings you resist it. Since we as the weaker also are in the wrong, it is not cowardice or crawling if we assume responsibility for what is personally explainable to me. It was a spur-of-the-moment action born out of fatigue and hostility. If you are in agreement, I will go with the camp spokesman and explain it to the commander. He will understand and will find a way out without insisting on learning the names of those responsible for this idiocy. But I will do it only if the majority is in agreement, otherwise I conduct myself as before and suffer the consequences with the rest of you. Let's go to bed, friends. At this hour no one is available anyway. Take, therefore, no thought for the tomorrow. For the tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself, the staff sergeant closes the fruitless discussion as lights out is sounded. 26. July 1945. A cloud-filled sky accompanies the brutal heat of the assembly area at the prisoner of war camp Fort Dupont, where at exactly 8am, on this fate-filled day, we German prisoners of war are assembled. With an impenetrable countenance, the camp spokesman stands in front of the group, glancing at the gate through which the decision in the form of American officers must come. And they do come, but not alone. 
Nearly half a company march into the area, make a column left, and stop across from us in front of the barracks. The camp spokesman reports smartly to an officer. He returns the salute, tells us to sit on the ground, and turns to his sergeants. Minutes later they send the brash young soldiers into our quarters. Arrayed, we mumble, upset and worry about the belongings in our sea sacks. At 9.30am it is over. The Americans have gone and we go to the mess hall for breakfast. That went well, I say to my two companions, after we have a carton of milk and two slices of white bread smeared with orange marmalade in front of us. Yes, if those boys didn't rob us, Kunza offers for thought and then concerns himself with the food. Now what will happen? Siegfried asks with full cheeks. We will soon know, I explain, as the camp spokesman enters the hall and asks for attention. The commander has informed me that he will not seek reprisals, since he has other methods at his disposal, he begins. Your stay here was to be temporary from the beginning. Still, I will not shed a tear for any of you. Then I have never met anyone as stubborn as you. My countrymen in this camp speak only with admiration for you, because you have shown that you have backbone. But I consider it a folly in our camp, but it was not all in vain. After breakfast, please be so good as to wash your work clothes so that other comrades will not be given them soiled. After 3 p.m., the room will be opened for you to turn in your bedding and other items. I will be pleased if during the day you will give the others a hand. Also, in the barracks, there is some work for you to do. Early tomorrow you will be sent away, as far as I have been informed. Take care of yourselves and see that you return home in good shape. I can't get rid of the feeling that there is a shortage of men there. After he has ended, the barracks threaten to collapse from the stamping of feet which accompanies him as he leaves the hall. The spokesman reminds me somewhat of Schultz, I scream in Siegfried's ear, and me of my father when I broke a window in the neighbour's house. He responds happily as the noise slowly dies down and the dining hall empties. Right after lunch, we three friends take the clean, dry work clothes from the line. We fold them neatly and take them to be collected by comrades who will turn them in later. Satisfied, we lie on the beds and eavesdrop for a while on what is going on inside the mattresses. At 3 p.m., the refreshing listening duty is at an end. A cold shower revives the blood, after which we help the work details to restore the camp to a new glow. During the daily inspection we see only satisfied faces. The sergeant appears during dinner to observe the tranquil serving of the food, but his mouth starts to water and he leaves in order not to be overcome by his desires. We lie in the cool grass in the shadow of the barracks after our day's effort and wonder about where we will end up. Perhaps for a change we will work in a factory, I comment and thereby dislodge a mighty discussion. That is out of the question to be a coolie in a stinking sweatshop, the staff sergeant begins. I could work as a locksmith since that was my civilian training, the pastor interjects. They could use me in the factory canteen because my father-in-law had a bar that I am to take over one of these days, a voting non-commissioned officer jokes. I'll go to the office, Siegfried adds. And I will go home, says Kunze, who has had an especially difficult day. That brings silence to the group. The thoughts rush across the ocean, climb over the dunes on the shore, follow various directions along the railroad tracks, and are lost in the confusion of the cavernous streets of the destroyed cities, until they find a well-known house and simply know nothing more, because in the meantime the world which once was, understood as the homeland, has collapsed. Not until a bugle blows retreat from the training camp do. We finally search out our beds. Alone, terribly alone, is the man in spiritual need, unless he has God with him. It is not clear why I was sent back to the East Coast in July 1945. In any event, it seems that my stay at Fort DuPont, one of the 150 major or base prisoner of war camps in the United States, as was Camp Greeley, was to be for only a short time, despite the conflict over the lost or forgotten equipment. If the plans were not already in motion to send me on to Glassboro, New Jersey, then me and the others would have been subjected to disciplinary action, or, presuming that we would have been treated with a measure of magnanimity on the part of the Americans, 
simply given a new assignment at Fort Dupont. As it was, five days after my arrival on the east coast from Colorado, I was sent to the camp at Glassboro, New Jersey, approximately 30 miles from Fort Dupont, Delaware. 27th of July, 1945 The voice of the camp spokesman is drowned in the noise of the engines. Laughingly, we wave goodbye to him as the wheels begin to turn. Fate takes us away from people who were well disposed to us. The guard passes around a pack of cigarettes while his eyes shine with what is best in people. Sympathy for others. Where are we going? Siegfried asks when he offers him a light. I don't know, perhaps to Fort Dix, he offers, while the convoy moves through the heavily populated area. Late in the afternoon we reach the small town of Glassboro, turn left off the main road, follow a lane lined with bushes, and stop in front of a small camp. The entire camp is surrounded by barbed wire. If it was not for the watchtower in the corner, one could imagine that the area in which a few apple trees stand is nothing but a box scout camp or youth hostel. After we leave the vehicles, we assemble in front of the rail gate and march past a primitive washroom into this island of peace. Since there is no one to lead us, and as a consequence no command is given, we come to a stop like a herd of sheep and glance around helpless. Aside from the US soldiers who brought us here and who sit in front of the barracks, no other soul is to be seen. We explore through the barracks, and our first impression is substantiated. The camp is completely empty. There are not even any beds in the barracks. There is nothing to do but seek refuge from the gruelling sun under the apple trees, where, because of fatigue, we fall asleep in a few minutes. After a good hour has passed, the crashing voice of an American wakes us from slumber. Does anyone speak English? he asks, friendly and glances enthusiastically at the group. Yes, answer many voices in chorus, at which he selects the best ones with a wave and calls them out for a meeting which is immediately translated by our comrades. You are now in a branch camp of the main camp, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and are under the command of Captain Brown. In order to get things going, I need a camp spokesman, translator, two clerks, a man for the clothing room, a mess chief, two cooks, two dishwashers, a medic, a man to handle the heat, and one for the sanitary facilities. All who feel inclined to one of these positions, please step forward. While the amused American watches the group debate, transports arrive at the gate loaded with bedding and mattresses. After some back and forth, he finally identifies the necessary men who are willing to take on the assignments temporarily. Immediately afterward, the camp springs into activity. Transports arrive from the main camp loaded with provisions, clothing and bedding. In less than two hours the barracks are set up, work crews assigned, bath water brought to boil and dinner prepared. Praise the German-American talent for organisation. I have received so many raw vegetables that I believe I can satisfy all of you. The mess chief greets his would-be eaters and fills the white porcelain plates to the top with green peas and bacon. We will be happy if in the land we can finally get this eternal hunger out of our guts. Siegfried jaws between Kunze and me, but in the next moment he incautiously burns his mouth and tightens up like a slabbed ram. Idiots! He screams above our laughter and soothes the burned lips with his tongue. Didn't you hear there is plenty of food? Why do you push it so much? I go after him. Because I only believe what I know. He laughs sticking out his chin and winking with the left eye. Did the mess sergeant really promise you so much? I return to the theme on the way to our quarters. If it stays like this in the future, I will be a good worker, Siegfried says with the sound of a vow. What kind of work do they have for us? Kunze asks. Perhaps the peach harvest, I joke, explaining that during the trip I noticed a number of well-cared-for orchards. They will not make the goat a farmer, I will eat everything I pick. Siegfried shoves the barracks door open. These quarters compare in no way with those in Camp Gruber. It is a long barracks, whose plank floor gives a strong impression of comfort and hominess, like those in Colorado. In addition, the walls are covered with a white-painted plywood, which was not the case in Camp Greeley. Our only complaint is the iron bunk beds, since fifty men must live together in each barracks. 
Naturally, it is only habit. In a few days, we will think nothing more about it. In general, I feel much at home as I now lie full but tired on my soft cot. At 7 a.m., Captain Brown wants to count his wards. If he knew how unwillingly we climbed out of bed to meet his wish, he would probably forget about it, because in the first place no one is locked up, and in the second place he is a fine fellow whose goodness radiates from every pore. But so that he will not be disappointed with us, we hurry out and stand in rows under the apple trees at the designated hour. I am pleased that we were able to get everything under roof and put away in such a short time, and I am convinced that in the future we will get along very well when my orders are carried out in a like manner. I will provide good and abundant food, but I expect that you will do a good job on your work assignments. You will help the farmers here in the state of New Jersey with the peach harvest. The farmers are instructed to handle you properly, and not to demand more of you than their own farm workers. The workday is eight hours. Lunch will consist of sandwiches, which will be passed out to the individual groups before work. The farmers are allowed to add something extra, but you do not have the right to demand it. Inside this enclosure you can enjoy every freedom, but you must obtain permission from me for every special event. That is all. After this speech full of hope, the captain and his entourage leave the camp. At ease, the newly designated camp spokesman Sergeant Klunger laughs and begins his own speech. I won't keep you long, just long enough to cover the important items. First of all, I want to make it perfectly clear that I am not eager for this position and that I am here for everyone who needs me. If someone believes he can do a better job, he is welcome to it. If I keep the position, I will be most grateful for any good suggestion. Now to specifics, we have the entire day tomorrow at our disposal to finish settling in. The camp is, by and large, clean, and what is still to be done will be finished tomorrow. After 9am, the clothing store will be open. Only work clothes will be given out at first. The exchange of bedding, etc. will be announced later. There is not much here for recreational activities. We have a barracks with a stage. The performers among us will be allowed to perform for the men without restriction. The assembly area can be used as a soccer field. Later the captain will arrange with a planning group to acquire land outside the barbed wire where we can burn up any extra energy. That is all for today. Good night. Are you comfortable, you old sleeping beauty? I bend down to Siegfried, who is on the bottom bunk. Yes, you raccoon, pull your claws in, he mumbles, half asleep. Put the picture away now, you will certainly see your Brigitte soon in the natural. I turn my head to Kunza, who lies at the same level, with only three feet of air separating us. Maybe you are right, he giggles. Sleep good, the day after tomorrow it is into the trees. There is little information available about the temporary prisoner of war camp established at Glassboro, New Jersey. It was a branch camp of Fort Dix, New Jersey, located to the northeast about 30 miles away. All German prisoners of war assigned to Glassboro were considered privates. According to labor reports, the camp contained between 350 and 400 prisoners of war. It operated just over three months, or the entire time that I was there from July 27 to November 6, 1945. Most of the prisoners were employed in the orchards around Glassboro, a city in 1945 of less than 10,000 people located in southwestern New Jersey. 29th of July, 1945. The gate of a prisoner of war camp is the central point around which all hope and also all the disappointment of the single day and night revolve. One day, a man can step through the gate into freedom and, in a certain sense, completely change his life into a different person when he goes into new surroundings with the determination to carry out his intentions. But it can also be that a free man comes through the gate to the prisoners and destroys all hope and good intentions. Yes, this free man, who by chance or what you could call providence, has been given power over the prisoners, is in the position to with only a few words, make resistors out of the willing, bad out of good, and bitterly disappointed out of the hopeful. The opposite can also occur, because prisoners do suffer, but they are always ready to change. That is why it does make a difference to whom they are entrusted, unless they are considered only objects. 
If that were the case, life would be meaningless. Every hope self-deception, life a lie, and the nihilists would be right. But there stands Captain Brown, exactly in the centre of the gateway of this branch camp of Fort Dix. The hand of his wristwatch is moving toward the eighth hour of this young day, while his own hand again and again guides a cup to his mouth and his eyes lie with good intentions on the fresh faces of the work details who are in the process of getting into the trucks of the waiting farmers. And now, from this moment on, the three groups of people which fate has brought together have the future in their own hands. On this playground that our Creator has set up for us, everything can turn toward good or bad. Captain Brown has demonstrated his goodwill from the first moment on, although it was probably known to him that we, for good reasons, were inclined to rebellion. If he did not happen to be an experienced man, who knows with what words he would have greeted us after one glance at the papers which accompanied us. As the saying goes, as you call into the woods, so will it respond back to you. But he called out something good, and I am certain that it found a good response. Now we will see if the third group in the league, the farmers, will consider us as objects of war booty, or see us as human beings that should be handled as such, and not expect more of us than our heavily laden nerves can endure. If fate is good, and we all understand one another and each one's situation, then we can make the best out of what the times require of us. The group for Farmer Ritter, please come to the gate, calls the American executive officer a friendly man who has a tolerable understanding of the German language and who finds lime to eat a sandwich while he works. Be good. Spokesman Kluger says goodbye to the group, which includes Kunze and me. Don't forget the peaches. Siegfried, who has been promoted to a clerk, reminds us as we march through the gate and are received by an older gentleman who would have been at home on any German farmstead. Judging by the truck... We are going to a respectable house, the pastor says, and makes the effort to be the first one on the truck. I would not pick up my countrymen in a manure wagon, the farmer stammers in awkward German and unleashes the first surprise for us. The second soon follows. The guard sits in the cab and not with us, as has been the case up to now. They trust us, we concur, while the truck follows along the road leading from the camp. The wheels have hardly touched the road before the new Ford hurries through the little city of Glassboro, and fifteen minutes later reaches a magnificent farmhouse lying in the middle of a green space, shaded by well-grown weeping willows and encircled by a low wall. Happily, we jump from the truck into the farmyard and wonder at this place of obvious well-being, sit down on the benches. I will see how far my people are, the good-natured farmer indicates and goes into the house. Before we can sit down and make ourselves comfortable on the benches which stand around a table under a weeping willow, a young girl in a fine outfit appears on the steps leading out of the house. The old gentleman could be well taken care of by her, slips out as my eaves go from the snow-white gloves over the entire figure clothed with a flower-print dress, to try and read the pretty face under the white hat. But the cosmetics have changed the face into a fashionable mask. Life comes into the doll. With quick steps, she goes from the house into a shed, where, after a moment, a motor howls, and a dreamlike picture of chrome, red-painted sheet metal, and glass on wheels rolls slowly into the yard. The girl sits like a sovereign at the wheel of this cloud of a vehicle, which in the next moment disappears with her out of the yard and out of our view. Never before have I found poverty so shameful as now at this minute, but we are in America, and the farmer reminds us of that. A young man comes out of the house toward us who is no better or worse clothed than we. This is my son Bill. He introduces his son. We will load the baskets there and some ladders on the old Mercedes. He points with his hand to a shed completely filled with round baskets. We go to work a little depressed from what has just happened. Just as we finish... The poem of a vehicle with her grace at the wheel stops right next to the old Mercedes. Get this woman out of our eyesight. I growl in silence to the farmer as I take a pack of camels from her hand. Amazed, the others also receive cigarettes and do not recover from this fright before the being from another world disappears into the shed with its automobile. We stand smoking in the yard while the father and son go through various work buildings, apparently looking for something. 
Finally, they are ready, and we can take a seat on the Mercedes. But before we drive off, the young lady appears again on the steps. And once again, she amazes us with her image. This time she is dressed in work overalls and a scarf. Idly, she pulls on the large chrome-coloured leather gloves and then goes through the yard with great charm to the tractor and starts the motor, then rattles through the yard. She is not such a fancy doll, the pastor murmurs, but he is the only one left cold by all the magic. After a few minutes, the Mercedes begins to move and we soon reach a grove of peach trees. So, here we are, the farmer says, and we jump down from the vehicle and wonder at the magnificent fruit on the trees. In the next moment, our teeth sink into the juicy fruit that lies on the ground. What is on the ground belongs to the pigs. Mr. Ritter laughs and picks a fine example from a tree, breaks it in two, and studies the degree of ripeness like an expert. We will start here, he says after a while, and begins to direct us.